so we're going to jump into a, a conversation about financing for the future of global health. I want to ask all our panelists to just join us on stage, and I'll, and I'll mention who you are as you, as you come up. Come on up. We've got Dr. Marianne Etiabet, who is the lead and executive director at MSD for Mothers. We've got uh, Annie Thiero, who is the chief investment officer at Grand Challenges Canada. Uh, let's see, next to you is James Snowden, the senior research analyst at GiveWell. Then we have Stephen Yeesees, who's the founder and managing partner at New Dimensions Health Fund. And then finally, Dr. Naveen Rao, who is the senior vice president and senior advisor to the president for the health initiative at Rockefeller Foundation. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Raj. So we did a report recently, and we found together that there was a $30 billion financing gap when it comes to saving the lives of mothers mm -hmm. during childbirth and after childbirth. A lot of the key issues many organizations here work on, the under five mortality, saving women's lives, um, they need that extra $30 billion. That gap is huge. In theory, there's lots of money out there. Some of it theory. represented on this <laughs> stage. Uh, maybe you can kick us off by talking about where are we now in what has been a multi-year journey to get to the point where terms like blended finance and impact investing and development impact bonds, where all of this starts to coalesce into something real. Where do you think we are today? Um, thank you, Raj. Um, I still think we're at the beginning. And, you know, I've said this before, we're, we're at the Gordon Gecko mobile phone stage of, of mobile phone technology. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Merck for Mothers is putting in a lot of sweat equity, uh, you know, to think about these innovative financing models that can blend uh, philanthropy capital, grant capital, debt, uh, venture capital. But we're finding that there are huge transaction costs. I mean, this, this, you know, these things take a lot of time. Uh, there's a lot of time and effort spent in matching investors uh, with investees. And we need to figure out how to do it better. You know, your, the title of this panel is, you know, how do we mobilize more money? Uh, I think that that is happening, although we do see that um, the, the percent of uh, money that in impact investing that's going to health is only about 14% or 9 to 14%. And it's actually moving down. So we need to stop <laughs> that, that, that trend, uh, reverse it. And I'm hoping the examples in the room will help us do that. Uh, but it's the other point I want to make, it's, it's not just about finding more money, it's about finding the right type of money uh, and the type of money that's going to give the right impact. Uh, the money has to be smart, uh, so it needs to be renewable. <laughs> uh, it has to be hardworking. Uh, we need to leverage uh, each other's uh, types of financing. And it has to give dividends. You know, I think that it's not just the health impact that we're looking for, but how can it also help drive local economies uh, and drive empowerment of, of women? And last but not least, uh, the money has to result in the right impact. Uh, we know that 60% of the deaths in many low and middle income countries is not because people lack access to services. It's because they lack access to quality of care. So we can flood these markets uh, with money. We can flood them with infrastructure projects. We can flood them with services. But unless those services are given in a high quality way, we're not going to have the health impacts that we want. Yeah. And what Merck for Mothers tries to do is bridge that gap uh, between finance and health uh, so that our money is having the right impact. I want to get Steve into the discussion on this exact point because you are the big <laughs> investor on stage. Well, you are investing uh, large scale deals, 100 to 500 million dollar deals in healthcare IT. Uh, you got a long history of doing that, including in frontier markets. How do you see the moment that we're in right now? Yeah, I, I see two important opportunities in emerging markets. Is First, as you talked about, there's so much activity, it's overwhelming for a lot of countries. And it's the same problem that a CIO faces of a large health system in the US. There's simply too many point solutions, too many pilots, and they can't scale them. So a lot of them are thinking, rethinking and redesigning and thinking about how they leverage base platform things like wiring their countries. Um, for education, government services, and access to healthcare into villages or into slums to get broader access. So what we're looking to do is frequently um, partner with regional, national governments or corporations that are looking to solve problems at scale quickly and thinking about things more holistically. So that's, those are opportunities where we will invest, co-invest with them sponsoring us so that we know that there's a they're there at the end of the day. 
and that they're committed to it. And in emerging markets, there is real money for healthcare. Um, so in places like Mexico, Brazil, India, uh, many, even Bangladesh, many other countries, there are active monies if you're partnering with telcos. Existing hospital systems or medical systems, frequently private, mm -hmm. that are looking to extend their scarce resources into the villages or un underserved communities. And what we're finding is they're building 21st century health systems and intentionally not replicating a lot of the costly things we have today. It's too expensive to put a physical clinic in everywhere where you have to have a staff of a doctor, a nurse, supplies. So they're looking at how do you leverage telemedicine, remote monitoring, a lot of new technologies to create a system that's much more cost effective. The second area that I think is hugely promising, and Andy and I share a story of this, is my last firm, Orbimed, which was a $15 billion fund with offices in the Middle East and Asia, as well as North America. We invested in a company called Mobile ODT that manages cervical cancer, basically using an iPhone, and then linking that to um, gynecologists and uh, OBGYNs that can help. But um, there's a whole host of new diagnostic technologies, a whole host of AI technologies, where we think the emerging markets are the place where these should be introduced. Yeah. So in AI, you'll hear stories like, this works better than 70% of doctors. Well, that means it doesn't work as well as 30% of doctors. Those 30% usually are in San Francisco or Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> so these are the wrong places to do it. But in a market where there's no access to healthcare, this can be a tremendous boon. And so we're encouraging a lot of emerging companies with emerging technologies to start in these markets because they can make it there, like New York, New York. You can dress it up and take it anywhere. <laughs> and, like, and that's how the true disruptive model yep. works that Clay Christensen designed, is you start in markets that are underserved with low cost offerings, and then through that experience and through the data, you're able to bring them up market. So those are the two areas that we're bullish and we see, and we think that to the original point that was made, by Mary Ann, there's a real discipline in private enterprises doing this mm -hmm. because if you're not efficient, you're not in business. Yep. So it forces, there's a forcing function on accountability and efficiency. I want to dig more into that point about, you know, the latest tech having the best opportunities in some of the most resource limited settings and turn to Naveen. You're going to have a big announcement right after this panel from Rockefeller Foundation. I don't want you to tell you anything about that yet. Uh, but I do want to hear about this idea of precision public health that you have introduced at the foundation and what that actually means, leveraging some of the tech that Steve just talked about. Great. Thank you. First, boy, am I glad I got rid of the tie. <laughs> 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 I actually walked into the tie and those guys said, San <laughs> 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 um, <Yeah>, Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the West Coast. Thank you. <laughs> uh, having said that, though, the philanthropies as such, and I can talk about Rockefeller in particular, we play a unique role that we can take chances and take long-term bets that a lot of people cannot. Our return on investment lens is different, and so that's one unique role we play. The other unique role is we can bring unusual partners to the table. And I just want to give a few examples and talk about those two in this panel today in the morning, and I'll stay with those two points. So about taking risks and thinking big, uh, the whole idea is why does public health have to languish in the 19th, 20th century when the rest of our lives have moved into the 21st century? And in our own lives, um, in the last 10 years, how much has changed in terms of the weather forecasting, GPS, banking, music? And yet, when you look, uh, public health still is in the 19th, 20th century. So the, we asked ourselves, can we not bring data, data science, uh, harness that, and we're calling that Precision Public Health. We launched it in September last year. It's about $100 million, core partners coming together, Rockefeller supporting and funding it. They're asking the question, can we bring data, data science to public health? Let me give you, um, let me start with a story that kind of will bring this to light. I was in uh, India, in Rajasthan, uh, about three months ago. And it was amazing that as I went into the huts, and this was unique, um, that it's happening even in East Africa, it's the same story in Sub-Saharan Africa if I were to go, is that in that hut, there is a husband, the farmer, and he has some kind of a mobile phone, whatever quality and, and however smart it is. <laughs> and on that, he has an app that tells him the weather forecast so he knows when to harvest, when to plant. He has an app that tells him the prices of his produce right now in the marketplace so he knows when to sell. These are all predictive analytic tools. He also has an app, kind of an Uber thing, to tell him how to take his produce to the market. In that same hut, 
today with the same technology, his wife, who's the community health worker, has 14 registers she's carrying. She fills in data and has no idea the value of the data. None of it comes back down to her. There are no predictive analytic tools. And this is in the same house. It, it exists even today, the technology. So we asked ourselves, why is it, why can we not give some predictive analytic tools to the frontline healthcare worker that could help her do her job better? So that is the concept of taking risks, thinking big, thinking long term. And then the second thing is about bringing unusual partners to the table. So it's not enough, and, and this panel is a good example, and most of you here represent different uh, organizations. But they talk about the golden triangle, um, where they have the government at the top who is responsible for the health of its population, and rightly so. One end of the triangle is civil society, and all of, our, all of that, the NGOs, the, uh, the philanthropies, all of that. And the third is private sector. And unless all three come together, this is too big for any one sector to solve. So that is the role philanthropy can also play, is be that convener, set the table, so to speak. Uh, and so that's the exciting stuff. Thank you, Raj. I want, I want to get back into your first point with Annie here, because <laughs> you know, Naveen has talked about the risk opportunity. There's <laughs> lots of interesting places where you can invest in new innovations. That's something Grand Challenges Canada does. You found hundreds of really exciting opportunities to put in relatively small amounts of money and try to scale up from a pilot stage to something that can really work. But what next? You know, this, yep. is, this is the panel about finding the big <laughs> dollars. Yep. So how do we take those yep. interesting innovations from small scale and actually make them big? Are you seeing that? Are you seeing more examples of it today? So, so that's really why I was brought into Grand Challenges Canada. My background is investing, venture capital, capital markets, uh, and otherwise. And uh, Grand Challenges Canada has been around for nine years. We've funded actually over 1,100 projects, mobilized a total of nearly a billion dollars Canadian for... Uh, for various innovators, and there's a broad range from academics to non-for-profit organizations to, to for-profit venture-backed companies. And uh, when we were looking at what to do next, really the hole that we saw, in, in particular in women and children's health, was that um, companies could get to a certain level, maybe raise a Series A, but at the Series B stage, there, there was a very big gap. And, and of course, we'll push the gap to the next phase, but that's really the journey that we've been on, is to try to put together uh, a, a good, healthy size investment fund to um, invest in, primarily in our case, dual market strategy companies that have uh, a very viable, vibrant business opportunity in, in the normal markets that we know in high-income countries, but that are specifically at a cost point that makes them applicable to low-income countries. We have uh, a network in over 96 countries through our prior work at GCC, and so the idea is to leverage that network of the largest donors, the largest foundations, to ensure that when we develop a technology that is uh, more effective at, at diagnosing or treating a condition for a woman or a child or an adolescent, that we disrupt the status quo of who wins. Today, who wins is, is us in these rooms. It's, it, and then who's forgotten is, yep. is you know, 80% of the world. And so we're trying to, to push, push, uh, push it another level, so to speak, by creating an instrument that's appealing for private investors. A big part of it is that golden triangle that Naveen mentioned. Exactly. And, you know, Catherine on stage a minute ago talked about Zipline and how they got the government of Rwanda as their first you know, their first customer, basically, they signed an MOU, that, that having that government role is so essential and sometimes falls apart. What, what's interesting about GiveWell, James, your organization, is you're saying, look, there are, there are things we know that work. Uh, yeah, there's lots of exciting opportunities over here. But on the other hand, there's things that work today that save lives at scale and that are cheap. So, uh, you know, bring, t tell us a little bit about GiveWell, but, but give us a sense of your perspective on a discussion like this today. Yeah, thanks, Raj. Um, yeah, so just to give a brief overview of GiveWell for those of us who are, are less familiar with us. Um, so so GiveWell is an organization that tries to find the charities, the giving opportunities that can save the most lives or improve lives the most per, per dollar. Um, and then we publish all our research online so donors can come to our website, decide where to give. Um, and we have eight recommended top charities, uh, generally implementing proven cost-effective uh, health interventions uh, like bed net distribution, vitamin A supplementation, and seasonal malaria chemo prevention. Um, and then last year, we moved about $140 million uh, to those charities, so donors giving to those charities on the basis of our recommendations, uh, which is about four times more than we moved in uh, the equivalent time period in 2014. So we've seen rapid growth. 
And I think kind of, you know, GiveWell's mission has always been um, to, to, to find the, the organizations that, that can help people the most with a, with a limited budget. Um, but what we found and what ma many of our donors have told us is that our research actually gives them the motivation to give it all. Um, and, and, and what we've seen in, in some of the philanthropic sector and, and particularly amongst retail level donors is uh, a lack of trust in the marketing material they get from charities and kind of feeling like you know, they're not being told the truth and they don't know how their funds are being used. Um, and so we try to address that through a, a principle of radical transparency and that's how we approach all of our work. Um, and what that means is uh, all the analysis and all the original spreadsheets and calculations that we use to make our recommendations are fully available online so you can go and see them. Um, we write about our mistakes when we make them and we do <laughs> make mistakes. Um, and then we try and build kind of long-term trusting relationships with donors rather than trying to raise as much money as, as quickly as possible. So that I think is, is a kind of, um, it, it's maybe a different approach to innovation. It, it, it's an innovation in terms of the way that we communicate and, and, and trying to cater to a need that we see in the philanthropic sector. Um, and just to kind of put this in perspective, so one of our, uh, you know, one of the charities that we recommend is a group called Malaria Consortium, who have really been spearheading the scale up of seasonal malaria chemo prevention across the Sahel, uh, which is an innovative program that uses actually very old technology. So these preventative malaria drugs have, have been around for a long time. Um, but in the last three years, uh, they've scaled this program to uh, serve over 10 million children. Um, and we estimate that they've prevented about 30,000 deaths in that time. So that's just a kind of indication of what's at stake mm -hmm. here and why it's so important that we really both use the funds as effectively as possible and also crowd as many funds as possible into, into global health. Um, and then finally, I should say, you know, we're not just about funding, you know, what works. And, and we've, we've made some uh, grants to kind of more exploratory areas mm -hmm. where we think there's, there's great uh, potential there. And in particular, Kind of over the last year, we, we're trying to expand the scope of our research in two different ways. Um, and so one is, you know, while, while in the past we've generally focused on providing a service to uh, retail level philanthropists as well as high net worth donors who come to our website, um, we're exploring opportunities to partner with, uh, with with aid agencies who I think you know, have access to much larger flows of funds than we do and, and help them, um, well, see if we can help them uh, identify opportunities which you know, they might not have been able to come across before and improve the level of monitoring and evaluation so they're really using the best tools uh, for the job. And then the second area we're looking to expand on is in the past we've really focused on uh, the kind of more direct quantifiable measurable impact because we think it's much easier to make that case. Uh, but now that we've been going for over 10 years, we, we think we've built up some level of expertise wi which will allow us to evaluate more complex theories of change. So that's things like providing technical assistance to governments to help them design public health regulations. Um, advocacy groups to, to advocate for, for spending on cost-effective health programs. Um, so those are the two areas we're expanding outwards in, um, and they're still very early stage, and I hope I'll be back here next year telling, us about all, telling you about all, all our successes. Um, but right now, it's a very exploratory area for us, uh, and, and we're, we're cautiously optimistic, but uh, we, we recognize that it will cause some challenges. I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to have you here at this event, and it's great to have GiveWell represented, is that there is a tidal wave of philanthropy coming into this space. Um, you know, obviously the Gates Foundation, they're here today and they've, they've radically transformed the space with their giving. But in, in a way, they were the, just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more wealth that's going to be coming through the Giving Pledge and other mechanisms right into the areas that, that so many organizations in this room work in. And the question is, will that money be effectively spent? Mm -hmm. Will it be part of what we, we all want to see? Uh, or will there be kind of whimsical programs here, non-evidence-based uh, ideas there? So I, I want to bring that maybe to, to all the panel, anybody who wants to talk about it. You know, if you were talking to the next big foundation that's out there, what do you want to see them do differently, or what, what do they need to understand about where we are today versus, you know, 20 years ago when the Gates Foundation was founded and they had to do a lot of the original research and, and thinking about how to be an effective philanthropy in global health? Yeah, uh, great question, and, and I think it's, it's about aligning on the goal, on the target, on the objective. It's, it's not about starting with, we have some money, we want to spend it in this space, you know, where can we do that? Um, it, it's about having those conversations about uh, what are the critical health <laughs> outcomes we want and what are the missing pieces that we need to bring together to get there including, as Stephen said, fundamental infrastructure investments uh, for digital and connectivity so that we have data transparency and accountability. Uh, Raj, the one group that's missing, mm -hmm. government. 
Yeah. Stephen mm -hmm. mentioned them. Uh, you know, par uh, part of what Mark from Mothers uh, does with uh, some of our large scale investments is making sure uh, that we are able to understand what the priorities of governments are. And when we bring in grant capital or private capital, it's supporting their strategic goals. Uh, and it's actually helping, uh, you know, accelerate, you know, progress uh, around that space. Right, they are an essential element to this. And maybe that's part of the advice to, to the philanthropy. They've got to work with government. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, and it, I, I hate to say this because it's all well intended and it's all meant to be good, but you just see so much waste globally where people haven't thought of it systemically of all the elements that are needed. And healthcare tends to be really complicated to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can come up with a great product, but if you don't have logistics or it's a biologic and you need cold storage, there's just so many places along the way where it can fall apart. So I think that... Um, that's why we're, and Catherine started this with partnerships. I think if you don't have that holistic system design, and this is where some of the foundational work will happen, some of this isn't, doesn't have an economic model today or even uh, capability today. And that, so I think where that can be seeded in these markets, that can be tremendously effective. Where we see less effect with philanthropy was where they rush in and try to do a program and they've done three things really well, but they forgot two things. And mm -hmm. the, the two things they forgot really mitigate the effect or like Marianne was saying, it works counterproductively to what the government health agency is trying to achieve, and then yep. you yep. create a lot of confusion. So um, all this activity is well intended, but it doesn't always lead to the... Yeah, yeah we're going to talk more today about, and we have some government representatives later today, we're going to talk more about the pilots, all these pilots that get started work at a very small scale and then maybe never can scale up from there, and how do we get out of that mode? Naveen, I know you have some mm -hmm. thoughts about this. No, actually, both the points I wanted to make, Marianne, and Stephen had made. <laughs> the fact that unless you get the countries and, and not what we think they want, but what they really need, uh, want, that, that's the perspective. And the other is the holistic approach, including the social determinants of health yeah. and putting it in a larger context because we confabulate health and healthcare. We keep saying health, but we talk about healthcare. Every time we say health, most of us think of doctors, hospitals, medicines, but that's a m small piece of your health, only 20% of your health depends on that. 80% of the health depends on where you live, the air you breathe, your zip code, how much violence mm -hmm. you're exposed to. And unless you are dealing with health, we're not going to be able to deal with just healthcare and think we're dealing with health. And I, as a doctor, I can tell you, we wait for you to fall sick. <laughs> <laughs> and once you fall sick and come into our system, we tune you up and then we put you back in the environment that caused the problem. And that is not the answer, especially in the developing world where they have the twin burdens of communicable and non-communicable disease on the rise, we're not going to be able to deal, build as many dialysis centers as is needed. The idea is to go upstream and, and work with diabetes upstream holistically. And, mm -hmm. and so truly it's about what the countries need and the holistic approach. So both points were made. We had an article, an opinion article on DevEx recently that made a similar point that we should think of investment in healthcare as a much broader circle that includes clean water, yep. sanitation, that includes cook stoves, yep. because if you're you know, in, a, in a polluted air environment at home, it doesn't really matter what the local healthcare system is like. We do have Sarah Anderson here, who we, we mentioned the Bay Area Health Alliance before. She's the executive director. And I, I wanted to get a chance to hear from you, if you would, um, if maybe Mike can come to you, um, because we'd love to hear your take on what you've heard so far, what we might be missing. Mm -hmm. I think it's on its way. No, no, let's wait because we want people on the live stream to be able to hear you well. It'll, it'll come on, I think. <laughs> it's systemic. Hang on a sec. Give it one more try. All right, you got a second one coming. <laughs> Redundancy is really critical in, in all In the systems. land of technology. All systems. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so very much. I appreciate the shout out. My name is Sarah Anderson, and I am the first um, executive director of the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. I am thrilled we were, f we were announced our formation here, and now we're up to 30 members and growing. Um, we've, I've been on the job for about a month now, and what we're aiming to do was a lot what Catherine was talking about and what I hear is resonating a lot in this panel, which is really connecting and mobilizing the different sectors in this community. And we have some from world-class 
academic institutions, a lot of NGOs, the tech sector, many other people in the private sector. So my question to you is, it sounds like there's so much going on as far as financing and things like that, but we also still have a lot of companies and people that aren't quite as involved as needed. So my question is, how do we get them more engaged? How do we keep it a sustainable engagement, both in terms of sharing their expertise and their capacity, as well as being generous donors. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and I'll go to anybody here on the panel who wants to tap into that question, because the reality is this community has tremendous wealth, tremendous innovation and technology, tremendous expertise, and yet it does seem as though there's, we're still in the nascent days of <laughs> tapping into that. Uh, anybody have a sense of where you want to see this go, Annie? Yeah, I, I can speak a bit to our approach. So, so our thinking around this is that, um, not to s say that it's not possible once a company is already large, but, but our, our view of it and what we've been talking about with potential funders of the fund is if we can start at the earliest stage of a company to get them thinking globally about the world, uh, we're going to have more success once they get larger and uh, eventually exited into a, a larger buyer. Um, if, if you integrate the concept of uh, it's not just the women in Los Angeles that needs a treatment, but it's also the women that are based in Tanzania, Uganda, India, um, it becomes the DNA of an organization. And we, we see that already in the GCC portfolio that is really quite an early stage portfolio. We invest, uh, you know, what we call our STARS programs is really an idea sometimes. Um, but we've already achieved, uh, you know, a large number of lives saved and a large number of lives improved. Uh, I think we can fit the lives saved in, in, a, in a hockey stadium. I'm from Canada. Uh, and uh, we, can, we can say that we've improved the lives of the same number of people as in the city of Montreal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and this is with very early seed investment. So our, our, our vision for it, at least from the GCC point of view, is that if we start funding companies with impact capital early on, we can perhaps create that DNA. Um, mm -hmm. That's a great vision. And just thinking about your examples, I don't know if they're here in the room, but Access Mobile is a, is a mobile health company that touches those exact countries, but in the opposite order. They started in Uganda, yeah. Kenya, and they came to Los Angeles with their tech. You know, kind of the Clay Christensen yeah. idea that C just mentioned. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think um, for health, we need patients. Um, I, it, it takes a while to actually see the impact of your investments. And not all of us are patient. Um, and, I, and I think that that is somewhat of a cultural change, you know, coming from venture capital space. Um, I think the other thing we need is to make it easy for people to come in by being transparent around where the opportunities are and actually being able to target people to where they are best placed to bring value. Uh, you know, so for example, uh, you know, when we think about pipeline, uh, you know, th I do think that there, there are lots of, um, there are lots of, uh, inconsistencies in the pipeline, you know, and, and there are lots of innovations that are at different stages on their maturity cycle. Uh, you know, M Merck for Mothers may not be the best partner from them from a financing perspective, but Annie, you know, <laughs> and I, we, we share pipeline, you know, exactly. one, once, you know, we fund them from this stage to this stage and we're like, Annie, you know, you take them to the next stage and, and vice versa. I don't think that there's enough transparency uh, between uh, the investor group uh, around all of those different uh, partners, uh, social entrepreneurs out there, uh, so that, again, we can reduce their transaction cost and, you know, there's a right fit. Yeah, and many of these exciting innovations, especially in the frontier markets, are really small startup organizations. They don't have the money to fly around the world and attend conferences. They're very focused on serving a specific population. We need to be set up to serve them, too. Uh, I, I, I think Naveen, maybe others want to jump in on this point. A final, as we, as we close out the panel, a final thought from, from any of you? No, this is, uh, I think all the points have been made. We need to speak their language. Right now, we don't. Global health, we speak our own language. Global development, we speak our own language. We wonder why the private sector and the people with money don't just trip over themselves to come to our doorstep. 
But if you look at the language we talk, and, and we, we talk in a completely different language, when they're talking return on investment, we talk about life saved. We talk, you know, and neither side is right, but we need to talk their language if we want to attract them. And there's some hidden assets that they can bring to the corporations to offer. And so there's some ministries of health, and the, I don't want to get into the morality of this, they're thinking, what is our asset? And our asset is, if we do DNA sequencing on our population, that's exceptionally valuable to Merck and to others and can be monetized. Could it, should it, different question and has to be considered. But I hate to be jaundiced, but a lot of big corporations with their philanthropy is about what's in it for them. But the way to bridge that gap and to get it to work in a way that's complementary to each other is to potentially look at some of these things, um, whether it's access to clinical trial patients, access to data, and a world of big data, where there is um, um, some benefit that they're achieving that's not specific or accountable, but you know they're accomplishing a greater good, but they're still getting something that's feeding part of their core mission. And so we do see ministries of health starting to think seriously about, you know, um, should we pay for sequencing mm -hmm. and then use that data to attract research dollars into our country to attract and it's people to programs. And, and I it's think important to be really model. upfront about those issues, the privacy, the human yeah. rights, the data ownership issues, that's to true. be really clear about what different partners' interests are. If you're not yeah. up clear about those things up front, the chances of a partnership succeeding are, are very slim. A, a last word from you, James. Yeah, I just wanted to give a slightly different perspective on this, which is how we get the philanthropists of tomorrow giving it a early yep. stage. Um, and so I guess I wanted to call out one, one partner organization we work with called Founders Pledge. And if there are any um, startup founders in the room, I, I think this is a, a great organization that might be of interest. So so what they do is, is they, they find um, you know, very early stage organizations and ask them to pledge a percentage of their exit funding um, to charity with the bet being that you know if, if your organization doesn't succeed, you will give nothing. And if you do succeed, you'll be a millionaire anyway. So <laughs> it's okay. Um, and they've had a lot of success kind of raising money. You know, we still want to see how those investments mature, mm -hmm. but um, they've got a lot of pledges, and I, I'm excited about that organization as well. So. Yeah, it, it is worth being excited about them. It's a 2% minimum you have to pledge to, and, uh, and it's, it's binding. You know, once you make that decision, you have to do it. Um, we've got to close out our, our discussion. I, I just, to, it's hard to sum up all the interesting points. I I'll just mention that, you know, the work you're doing at GiveWell, and a lot of what we talked about here before, in a way, we are going to soon hit a point where we can fund all the currently underfunded things. And we may have to get into more complex systems-oriented change. The things that can require patience, that can be frustrating, that may require totally new paradigm changes using technology and, and investment. And that's why it's so critical that we have this kind of discussion. We think about how do we build a whole industry that can serve these markets. 